Hello everyone and welcome to a special additional segment to the 30th episode of my Realism Overhaul series in Kerbal Space Program 1.1.3. In that episode I introduced this rocket, Nico 1744, but this isn't the only design I came up with. The other designs I'm not going to launch just yet, but I thought I should introduce those designs before somebody suggested them in the comments. So in this separate video, I'll go through some of the ideas I had based on this sort of similar setup, the Nico system. First of all, we have the Nico 2544. It might have occurred to some of you that it might be better to have four boosters, four larger boosters, instead of eight smaller ones, and to have four of the NK-15 engines on each of those boosters so they look a lot more like the Soyuz boosters. Well, I had thought of that a long time ago. In fact, on a live stream, I already designed this particular rocket, and so I already had this in mind even when I made the Nico 944. So this is Nico 2544 with the, with the 16 engines on the boosters in total and then 9 engines on the core. And if we take a look at MechJeb, we see, well, it's not really showing the proper burn time. Let me try and move the 9 engines to a different stage. Uh, so the boosters last for 2 minutes and 5 seconds, and the core for the 2 minutes and 48 that we saw in the 30th episode of Realism Overhaul. So, yeah, that is how it works. And that gives us a healthy 1.47 thrust to weight ratio. And even with a little bit of buffer on the delta V that we have for orbit, we are carrying 105 tons, in this case still as the same perennially doomed fuel tank, but uh, the rocket itself, the fuel tank, tank costs uh, 6000 so this rocket itself costs uh, 44000 and uh, 105 tons is a conservative estimate for its payload to orbit based on the fact that likely some of these engines are going to fail, right? Uh, we saw that in the 30th episode, and well, in this case, uh, we have more redundancy. After all, on the N1 itself, the reason why it had so many engines was because of the expectation of the failure of some of those engines and to make sure that uh, redundancy would take care of that. But yeah, I'll need to move the separatrons. This is probably not the safest way to try and decouple this right now. But you get the idea and it is a fine looking rocket and we will hope to eventually use it. It's still lighter than the Saturn V. Um, even though it's not using any cryogenic fuels, 105 tons, pretty good payload and a good thrust to weight ratio initially so we actually probably don't need as much delta v to orbit as we did before but again who knows what will happen with engine losses anyway there is a more interesting design that i had in mind so let's move on to that the thing about the nico naming convention is that it allows for certain interesting numbers and remember that the last digit indicates the number of NK9Vs or NK19s and perhaps later NK31s, the same basic engine, just upgraded, that we'll be using. The second digit uh, from the right indicates the number of second stage engines, which were the NK15Vs that we have. And then the first two digits, or one digit depending on how many there are, the first digits indicate the number of NK15s. So with the 1744, we had 17 NK-15s on the first stage, well, including the boosters, right? Um, but here we have the Nico 1701 Alpha. 1701, of course, in reference to the NCC-1701 of uh, Star Trek fame, the Enterprise. And uh, this is Alpha, because uh, boy is it Alpha. But what this implies, of course, and I'm keeping the fairing on for a sec, is that there are there is the 17 engines of the NK-15 variant, so we have the 8 boosters and 9 core engines, and then no second stage, no NK-15V, but a single NK-9V or NK-19. Um, this is obviously not the most efficient setup. It is pretty ridiculous. Uh, but it has the benefit of um, having that number. <laughs> it doesn't have any other benefit. It really doesn't. Uh, it's not a good rocket altogether. It is remarkably simple. And as we saw with the first stage on the launch in the 30th episode, rather stable even if it loses some engines. So it's got that going for it. Um, well, here we go. 
So this is the the configuration we have. And hold on a sec. Uh, there's a lot to unpack here. First of all, we've got a a Kelly spacecraft with a shortened uh, tank here. The total delta V in this is uh, well, we have to remove this. Uh, 1,281. We should probably lock up. We, we really don't have cross-feeding, but let's just lock the fuels for safety's sake. It's got its uh, fuel cells, it's got its parachutes, it's got its heat shield, and advanced solar panels. These are the ones that don't retract. They do provide 410 watts each, so it's got a much better uh, power situation. And, of course, a docking port at the bottom, because this body is meant to be reused. Uh, this remains in orbit and uh, you can reuse it and what we have here in the quote-unquote engine nacelles, I wish I had tweak scale on these RAM intakes but I don't have tweak scale in this because tweak scale is not RP0 happy I guess. Uh, but we have Asterisk engines here. Actually we have the upgrade to the Asterisk engine. Uh, we have this Asterisk 2 it allowed us to use. I'm not entirely sure that's reasonable, but hey, if we've got it, we might as well use it since this is an, an, an advanced vessel. Um, we've got the solar panels on the side because this body has to be independent. You can see all of its probe cores. It's got eight of these Delta Avionics packages, so it can handle 80 tons. The docking port on top, of course, and uh, yeah, lots of RCS ports so it can handle the docking as well. These pods have the Arizona N204. This, however, has kerosene and oxygen because this is the old um, one one engined NK uh, 19 stage from the Nico 421 and Nico 621 uh, 411 and 621, and so this is the NK 19 that we have right now. Um, if we pull this off, and um, but you can see we've made some adjustments. Um, in particular, it has. A control over its own, the Delta Avionics package, batteries, communications, and uh, RCS ports, and one kilonewton thrusters. The reason is that the NK19 only has one ignition. So if we're going to re reuse this tank, you know, fill it up and be able to attach an engine and, you know, go and use the kerosene and oxygen, we'll need to replace this every time it's used. Well, uh, this is the way we replace it. All we need is some small payload launcher to launch this segment. This segment can independently dock with uh, this vessel which will remain in orbit and then it'll work. Uh, we can also launch this pod on a smaller launcher. So this will be launched on the you know Nico 17 engined uh, first stage but then this top part and this bomb part can be replaced each time and those will launch on a much smaller rocket and much cheaper. So this will remain in orbit to be reused. That's the idea anyway. Is it a good idea? I'm not entirely sure. We're not ready to use it just yet. Uh, you can see the internal uh, uh, delta V of this is 4,943. Uh, we could probably improve on that uh, if we got a uh, longer burn time on this. The problem is that this engine is only rated for 7 minutes and 30 seconds right now. So it's a little bit, uh, we, we're using 7 minutes and 26 seconds. But if we get later variants of it, uh, actually let me jump, double check that I'm not using, I'm pretty sure I'm not using the NK9V number there. Um, let's see. Um, the NK19, uh, yeah, that's 7 minutes and 30 seconds. The NK9V only had 4 minutes. But if we can upgrade it to the NK19 through new technology, we can burn it for 10 minutes. And then, instead of having this tank be 72% utilization, we will up it, uh, well, pretty close to its max, really. We'll need to worry about avionics, but uh, yeah, if we max this out, uh, we'll have the burn time of the NK31. Uh, but for now, we have to keep it... Well, down here-ish. So that's the idea. This also has kerosene and oxygen, but we can't really use it because otherwise this will lose its one ignition. The NK31 has two ignitions, so that's handy. But uh, it's a complicated sort of vessel. And not necessarily the brightest idea. It is possible for us to still have an NCC-1701, uh, or NICO-1701, uh, 
And we'll have the this um, NK-19 stage be a separate stage and not part of the vessel itself. We could configure this to be completely hypergolic. And so that's another idea. So we'll have a, the 17 engine first stage. This stage uh, acting independently to continue it to orbit. And then finally some spacecraft that uses pure hypergolics. Oh, by the way, I do have these. I mean, there's a lot that's dodgy about this, by the way. First of all, the wobbly docking ports are a worry because it's all uh, in line. It's all docking ports. And then, of course, I have put Infernal Robotics Extendatrons because I couldn't help myself. And that, okay, wait, wait. I want both of them to go out. So, yeah, um, we have this sort of uh, pretend it's, you know, first contact or something. So we've got that going for us. Uh, there is a benefit to that in that these outer RCS ports will have better leverage being out there. But otherwise it's a minor thing. We could re reconfigure the solar panels in various ways too. Oh, I, I forgot to mention the main idea of this. Uh, this is a life support tank. That, that's all life support. That's not fuel. And we'll have to re resupply the life support regularly as well. But for two crew members, that's one year and 248 days of life support, which I think would be enough to supply a uh, Mars flyby mission. With one uh, crew member, uh, we have you know more than three years worth, and that could be a much more substantial mission, potentially. So this is, you know, this is not a lightweight craft when you think about it. Uh, if you do refuel this and go, it could get places. Uh, obviously, if this is completely fueled up, 4,943, it happens to be enough to transfer to the moon, make orbit around the moon, and then break orbit around the moon. So you take about 3,100 meters per second to get there. You take uh, 800 to get into relatively low orbit, so that's 3,900, and you reserve 1,000 to get back home. And that, that's what we have here. And note that the amount to get back home and make orbit around the moon is supplied by the hypergolics. So we won't have to rely on this engine to do that. And we can, in fact, get more efficiency if we decouple this and this fuel is expended. Well, it only shows 2,265 anyway, so maybe not more efficient. I don't know. Maybe it's already counting that. But anyway, oh, and remember that we still have this fuel, so, and that's actually 1,281 once this is off, and that could return home from the moon all on its own. There's nothing about this that would have any trouble returning home from the moon. It's got better solar panels to recharge. It's got the fuel cell as a backup. It's got the little lunar Gemini, uh, the advanced Gemini lander engines which uh, have infinite reignitions. So lots of interesting things. The one point about this though is that there is no launch escape system. Uh, none of this is uh, providing a high enough thrust to escape and also in order to escape we would need to separate the fairings because it's not out in the open, it's inside the fairings, it's encapsulated. Uh, which obviously begs the question how the crew get inside uh, we'll have to work on that, but because of these outer pods, it's a little bit hard. Is it the best design? No, it's meant to be stylish, let's face it. Stylish and functional in interesting ways with the docking ports. There is one other dubious business, and that's the placement of the Saturn One instrument unit. Uh, before, where the Saturn One instrument unit used to be was on an interstage, because the interstage has two different nodes. But now we're using a fairing, uh, fairing adapter, and when I clicked on it, it did this. And the problem with this is that I'm moving this in like this. I'm not entirely sure that's a safe procedure. So we've got that question mark for us as well. But anyway, this is another design, and this will have a beta version and a gamma version before we really call it the Nico 1701 but the idea is for a legit interplanetary vessel 
Uh, well, I mean, I'm pushing it, launching it like this, but it would be interesting. Now, another downside, because uh, we have to name all of them ahead of time before we uh, ever commit to this sort of thing, is that you'll notice the high thrust weight ratio at the end of the first stage. Of course, because it's not lifting the second stage anymore, it's just lifting the spacecraft. And the, well, basically what that means is that we're going to have to throttle down. And the, the throttle on the NK-15 is 48% minimum. So we'll be able to throttle down to limit the thrust weight ratio to about 5.5, but that's the best we can do. So on the way up, the crew is going to be experiencing 5.5 Gs. Uh, there is a, another caveat in that when we do thrust limit, uh, there will be an extension of the burn time, which will probably mean failure of some engines. <laughs> So we've got that going for us too. On the bright side, there's plenty of Delta V in the spacecraft to make orbit after all the mayhem. So yeah, though the thrust weight ratio of the single NK-19 might be a little bit dubious. Yep. Uh, it's possible that it might be a good idea to not fuel up these outer pods initially. Doesn't help the thrust weight ratio that much though. Hmm. Maybe not necessary. We'll see. It's not that expensive, it's only 49,000 funds, so it's equivalent to one of our moon missions because it's using the same stage. I'm not planning to recover the first stage on this setup because there's no way when it's going that fast it'll be recoverable. And by the way, uh, we have a very high initial thrust to weight ratio too, so there's going to be plenty of stress on this vehicle. Thank goodness the engines throttle down and tend to go out randomly, right? Uh, it's a bonus now, it's a bonus. Yeah, but we will be seeing some more sci-fi-ish things in this series once we get past the, the whole moon phase of things, well, you know, the moon landings, and as far as human beings have actually gotten, I'll feel a little bit more free about uh, doing wacky things because it's not like somebody has actually done them before, so there's no telling how it will be done. Uh, Elon Musk and SpaceX have sort of demonstrated that with the ITS system, and I feel justified in coming up with my own interesting spacecraft. Alright, so on that note, I'll say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.